Chapter 10, The Death of Yemuka, 1202 to 1203. In the meantime, while these events had been occurring in the country of the Naimans, whither Vang Khan had fled, Temujin was carrying all before him in the country of Vang Khan. His victory in the battle was complete, and it must have been a very great battle if any reliance is to be placed on the accounts given of the number slain, which it was said amounted to 40,000. These numbers are, however, greatly exaggerated. And then, besides, the number slain in such barbarian conflicts was always much greater in proportion to the numbers engaged than it is in the better regulated warfare of civilized nations in modern times. At all events, Temujin gained a very grand and decisive victory. He took a great many prisoners and a great deal of plunder. All those trains of wagons fell into his hands, and the contents of many of them were extremely valuable. He took also a great number of horses. Most of these were horses that had belonged to the men who were killed or who had been made prisoners. All the best troops that remained of Vang Khan's army after the battle also went over to his side. They considered that Vang Khan's power was now entirely overthrown, and that, thenceforth, Temujin would be the acknowledged ruler of the whole country. They were, accordingly, ready at once to transfer their allegiance to him. Very soon Temujin received the news of Vang Khan's death from his father-in-law, Taiyan, and then proceeded with more vigor than before to take possession of all his dominions. The Khans, who had formerly served under Vang Khan, sent in their adhesion to him one after another. They not only knew that all farther resistance would be useless, but they were, in fact, well pleased to transfer their allegiance to their old friend and favorite. Temujin made a sort of triumphal march through the country, being received everywhere with rejoicings and acclamations of welcome. His old enemies, Sankum and Yamuka, had disappeared. Yamuka, who had been, after all, the leading spirit in the opposition to Temujin, still held a body of armed men together, consisting of all the troops that he had been able to rally after the battle, but it was not known exactly where he had gone. The other relatives and friends of Vang Khan went over to Temujin's side without any delay. Indeed, they vied with each other to see who should most recommend themselves to his favor. A brother of Vang Khan, who was an influential and powerful chieftain, came among the rest to tender his services, and, by way of a present, to conciliate Temujin's goodwill, he brought him his daughter, whom he offered to Temujin as an addition to the number of his wives. Temujin received the brother very kindly. He accepted the present, which he brought him of his daughter, but as he had already plenty of wives, and as one of his principal officers, the captain of his guards, seemed to take a special fancy to her, he very generously, as was thought, passed over the young lady to him. Of course, the young lady herself had nothing to say in the case. She was obliged to acquiesce submissively in any arrangement which her father and the other Khans thought proper to make in respect to the disposal of her. The name of the prince, her father, was Hakambu. He came into Temujin's camp with many misgivings, fearing that, as he was a brother of Vang Khan, Temujin might feel a special resentment against him, and perhaps refuse to accept his submission and his proffered presence. When, therefore, he found how kindly he was received, his mind was greatly relieved, and he asked Temujin to appoint him to some command in his army. Temujin replied that he would do it with great pleasure, and the more readily because it was the brother of Vang Khan who asked it. Indeed, he said to Hakambu, I owe you all the kind treatment in my power for your brother's sake, in return for the succor and protection for which I was indebted to him, in my misfortunes, in former times, when he received me 
a fugitive and an exile, at his court, and bestowed upon me so many favors. I have never forgotten, and never shall forget, the great obligations I am under to him. And although in later years he turned against me, still I have never blamed either him or his son Sankum for this, but have constantly attributed it to the false representations and evil influence of Yamoka, who has always been my implacable enemy. I do not, therefore, feel any resentment against Vang Khan for having thus turned against me, nor do I any the less respect his memory on that account, and I am very glad that an opportunity now occurs for me to make, through you, his brother, some small acknowledgment of the debt of gratitude which I owe him. So Temujin gave Hakambu an honorable post in his army, and treated him in all respects with great consideration. If he acted usually in this generous manner, it is not at all surprising that he acquired that boundless influence over the minds of his followers which aided him so essentially in attaining his subsequent greatness and renown. In the meantime, although Sankum was killed, Yamuka had succeeded in making his escape, and, after meeting with various adventures, he finally reached the country of Taiyan. He led with him there all that portion of Vang Khan's army that had saved themselves from being killed or made prisoners, and also a great number of officers. These broken troops Yamuka had reorganized as well as he could by collecting the scattered remnants and rearranging the broken squadrons, and in this manner, accompanied by such of the sick and wounded as were able to ride, had arrived in Taiyan's dominions. He was known to be a general of great abilities, and he was very favorably received in Taiyan's court. Indeed, Taeyin, having heard rumors of the rapid manner in which Temujin was extending his conquests and his power, began to be somewhat jealous of him, and to think that it was time for him to take measures to prevent this aggrandizement of his son-in-law from going too far. Of course, Taeyin held a great many conversations with Yamaka in respect to Temujin's character and schemes. These Yamaka took care to represent in the most unfavorable light, in order to increase as much as possible Taeyin's feelings of suspicion and jealousy. He represented Temujin as a very ambitious man, full of schemes for his own aggrandizement, and without any sentiments of gratitude or of honor to restrain him in the execution of them. He threw wholly upon him the responsibility of the war with Vang Khan. It grew, he said, out of plots which Temujin had formed to destroy both Vang Khan and his son, notwithstanding the great obligations he had been under to them for their kindness to him in his misfortunes. Yamuka urged Taeyin also to arouse himself before it was too late, to guard himself from the danger. He is your son, it is true, said he, and he professes to be your friend, but he is so treacherous and unprincipled that you can place no reliance upon him whatever, and, notwithstanding all your past kindness to him and the tie of relationship which ought to bind him to you, he will as readily form plans to compass your destruction as he would that of any other man the moment he imagines that you stand in the way of the accomplishment of his ambitious schemes. These representations, acting upon Taeyin's natural apprehensions and fears, produced a very sensible effect, and at length Taeyin was induced to take some measures for defending himself from the threatened danger. So he opened negotiations with the Khans of various tribes, which he thought likely to join him, and soon formed quite a powerful league of the enemies of Temujin, and of all who were willing to join in an attempt to restrict his power. These steps were all taken with great secrecy, for Yamaka and Taeyin were very desirous that Temujin should know nothing of the league which they were forming against him until their arrangements were fully matured and they were ready for action. 
They did not, however, succeed in keeping the secret as long as they intended. They were generally careful not to propose to any khan or chieftain to join them in their league until they had first fully ascertained that he was favorable to the object of it. But, growing less cautious as they went on, they at last made a mistake. Tayin sent proposals to a certain prince or khan named Alicus, inviting him to join the league. These proposals were contained in a letter which was sent by a special messenger. The letter specified all the particulars of the league with a statement of the plans which the allies were intending to pursue, and an enumeration of the principal khans or tribes that were already engaged. Now it happened that this Alicus, who reigned over a nation of numerous and powerful tribes on the confines of China, was, for some reason or other, inclined to take Temujin's side in the quarrel. So he detained the messenger who brought the letter as a prisoner, and sent the letter itself containing all the particulars of the conspiracy at once to Temujin. Temujin was greatly surprised at receiving the intelligence, for, up to that moment, he had considered his father-in-law, Tayian, as one of his best and most trustworthy friends. He immediately called a grand council of war to consider what was to be done. Temujin had a son named Juki, who had now grown up to be a young man. Juki's father thought it was now time for his son to begin to take his place and act his part among the other princes and chieftains of his court, and he accordingly gave him a seat at this council, and thus publicly recognized him for the first time as one of the chief personages of the state. The council, after hearing a statement of the case in respect to the league which Taeyin and the others were forming, were strongly inclined to combine their forces and march at once to attack the enemy before their plans should be more fully matured. But there was a difficulty in respect to horses. The horses of the different hordes that belonged to Temujin's army had become so much exhausted by the long marches and other fatigues that they had undergone in the late campaigns that they would not be in a fit condition to commence a new expedition until they had had some time to rest and recruit. But a certain khan named Bule, an uncle of Temujin's, at once removed this objection by offering to furnish a full supply of fresh horses for the whole army from his own herds. This circumstance shows on what an immense scale the pastoral occupations of the great Asiatic chieftains were conducted in those days. Temujin accepted this offer on the part of his uncle, and preparations were immediately made for the marching of the expedition. As soon as the news of these preparations reached Yamuka, he urged Taeyin to assemble the allied troops immediately and go out to meet Temujin and his army before they should cross the frontier. It is better, said he, addressing Taeyin, that you should meet and fight him on his own ground, rather than to wait until he has crossed the frontier and commenced his ravages in yours. No, said Taeyin in reply, it is better to wait. The farther he advances on his march, the more his horses and his men will be spent with fatigue, the scantier will be their supplies, and the more difficult will he find it to effect his retreat after we shall have gained a victory over him in battle. So Taeyin, though he began to assemble his forces, did not advance, and when Temujin, at the head of his host, reached the Naaman frontier, for the country over which Taeyin reigned was called the country of the Naamans, he was surprised to find no enemy there to defend it. He was the more surprised at this from the circumstance that the frontier, being formed by a river, might have been very easily defended. But when he arrived at the bank of the river, the way was clear. He immediately crossed the stream with all his forces, and then marched on into the Naaman territory. Temujin took good care, as he advanced, to guard against the danger into which Taeyin had predicted that he would fall, that of exhausting the strength of his men, and of his animals, and also his stores of food. He took good care to provide and to take with him abundant supplies, 
and also to advance so carefully and by such easy stages as to keep both the men and the horses fresh and in full strength all the way. In this order and condition, he at last arrived at the spot where Tayian had formed his camp and assembled his armies. Both sides immediately marshaled their troops in order of battle. Yamaka was chief in command on Tayian's side. He was assisted by a young prince, the son of Tayian, whose name was Kushluk. On the other hand, Juki, the young son of Temujin, who had been brought forward at the council, was appointed to a very prominent position on his father's side. Indeed, these two young princes, who were animated by an intense feeling of rivalry and emulation toward each other, were appointed to lead the van on their respective sides in commencing the battle. Juki, advancing first to the attack and being met by Kushluk, to whom was committed the charge of repelling him. The two princes fought throughout the battle with the utmost bravery, and both of them acquired great renown. The battle was commenced early in the morning and continued all day. In the end, Temujin was completely victorious. Tayian was mortally wounded early in the day. He was immediately taken off the field, and every possible effort was made to save his life, but he soon ceased to breathe. His son, the Prince Kushluk, fought valiantly during the whole day, but toward night, finding that all was lost, he fled, taking with him as many of the troops as he could succeed in getting together in the confusion, and at the head of this band made the best of his way into the dominions of one of his uncles, his father's brother, where he hoped to find a temporary shelter until he should have time to determine what was to be done. As for Yamaka, after fighting with desperate fury all day, he was at last, toward night, surrounded and overpowered, and so made prisoner. Temujin ordered his head to be cut off immediately after the battle was over. He considered him not as an honorable and open foe, but rather as a rebel and traitor, and consequently undeserving of any mercy. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11. Establishment of the Empire, 1203. There was now a vast extent of country, comprising a very large portion of the interior of the Asiatic continent, and indeed an immense number of wealthy, powerful hordes under Temujin's dominion, and he at once resolved to consolidate his dominion by organizing a regular imperial government over the whole. There were a few more battles to be fought in order to subdue certain khans who still resisted and some cities to be taken. But these victories were soon obtained, and in a very short time after the great battle with Tayian, Temujin found himself the undisputed master of what to him was almost the whole known world. All open opposition to his rule had wholly disappeared, and nothing now remained for him to do but to perfect the organization of his army, to enact his code of laws, to determine upon his capital, and to inaugurate generally a system of civil government such as is required for the management of the internal affairs of a great empire. Temujin determined upon making Karakoram his capital. He accordingly proceeded to that city at the head of his troops, and entered it in great state. Here he established a very brilliant court, and during all the following winter, while he was occupied with the preliminary arrangements for the organization and consolidation of his empire, there came to him there a continual succession of ambassadors from the various nations and tribes of Central Asia to congratulate him on his victories and to offer the allegiance or the alliance of the khans which they respectively represented. These ambassadors all came attended by troops of horsemen, splendidly dressed and fully armed, and the gaiety and magnificence of the scenes which were witnessed in Karakoram during the winter surpassed all that had ever been seen there before. In the meantime, while the attention of the masses of the people was occupied, and amused by these parades, Temujin was revolving in his mind 
the form of constitution which he should establish for his empire, and the system of laws by which his people should be governed. He conferred privately with some of his ablest counselors on this subject, and caused a system of government and a code of laws to be drawn up by secretaries. The details of these proposed enactments were discussed in the Privy Council, and when the whole had been well digested and matured, Temujin, early in the spring, sent out a summons calling upon all the great princes and khans throughout his dominions to assemble at an appointed day, in order that he might lay his proposed system before them. Temujin determined to make his government a sort of elective monarchy. The grand khan was to be chosen by the votes of all the other khans, who were to be assembled in a general convocation for this purpose whenever a new khan was to be installed. Any person who should cause himself to be proclaimed grand khan, or who should in any other way attempt to assume the supreme authority without having been duly elected by the other khans, was to suffer death. The country was divided into provinces, over which of each a subordinate khan ruled as governor. These governors were, however, to be strictly responsible to the Grand Khan. Whenever summoned by the Grand Khan, they were required to repair at once to the capital, there to render an account of their administration, and to answer any charges which had been made against them. Whenever any serious case of disobedience or maladministration was proved against them, they were to suffer death. Temujin remodeled and reorganized the army on the same or similar principles. The men were divided into companies of about 100 men each, and every ten of these companies was formed into a regiment, which, of course, contained about a thousand men. The regiments were formed into larger bodies of about 10,000 each. Officers were appointed of all the various necessary grades to command these troops, and arrangements were made for having supplies of arms and ammunition provided and stored in magazines under the care of the officers, ready to be distributed to the men whenever they should require. Temujin also made provision for the building of cities and palaces, the making of roads, and the construction of fortifications, by ordaining that all the people should work one day in every week on these public works whenever required. Although the country over which this new government was to be established was now at peace, Temujin was very desirous that the people should not lose the martial spirit which had thus far characterized them. He made laws to encourage and regulate hunting, especially the hunting of wild beasts among the mountains, and subsequently he organized many hunting excursions himself in connection with the lords of his court and the other great chieftains in order to awaken an interest in the dangers and excitements of the chase among all the khans. He also often employed bodies of troops in these expeditions, which he considered as a sort of substitute for war. He required that none of the natives of the country should be employed as servants or allowed to perform any menial duties whatever. For these purposes, the people were required to depend on captives taken in war and enslaved. One reason why he made this rule was to stimulate the people on the frontiers to make hostile excursions among their neighbors, in order to supply themselves and the country generally with slaves. The right of property in the slaves thus taken was very strictly guarded, and very severe laws were made to enforce it. It was forbidden, on pain of death, to harbor a slave or give him meat or drink, clothing or shelter, without permission from his master. The penalty was death, too, if a person meeting a fugitive slave neglected to seize and secure him and deliver him to his master. Every man could marry as many wives as he pleased, and his female slaves were all, by law, entirely at his disposal to be made concubines. There was one very curious arrangement which grew out of the great importance which, as we have already seen, was attached to the ties of relationship and family connection among these pastoral nations. Two families could bind themselves together and make themselves legally one in respect to their connection 
by a fictitious marriage arranged between children no longer living. In such a case, the contracts were regularly made, just as if the children were still alive, and the ceremonies were all duly performed. After this, the two families were held to be legally allied, and they were bound to each other by all the obligations which would have arisen in the case of a real marriage. This custom is said to be continued among some of the Tartar nations to the present day. The people think, it is said, that such a wedding ceremony, duly solemnized by the parents of children who are dead, takes effect upon the subjects of it in the world of spirits, and that thus their union, though arranged and consecrated on earth, is confirmed and consummated in heaven. Besides these peculiar and special enactments, there were the ordinary laws against robbery, theft, murder, adultery, and false witness. The penalties for these offenses were generally severe. The punishment for stealing cattle was death. For petty thefts the criminal was to be beaten with a stick, the number of the blows being proportioned to the nature and aggravation of the offense. He could, however, if he had the means, buy himself off from this punishment by paying nine times the value of the thing stolen. In respect to religion, the constitution which Temujin made declared that there was but one God, the creator of heaven and earth, and it acknowledged him as the supreme ruler and governor of all mankind, the being who alone gives life and death, riches and poverty, who grants and denies whatever he pleases, and exercises over all things an absolute power. This one fundamental article of faith was all that was required. For the rest, Temujin left the various nations and tribes throughout his dominions to adopt such modes of worship and to celebrate such religious rites as they severally preferred, and forbade that anyone should be disturbed or molested in any way on account of his religion, whatever form it might assume. At length the time arrived for the grand assembly of the Khans to be convened. The meeting was called, not at Karakoram, the capital, but at a central spot in the interior of the country, called Dilan Ildak. Such a spot was much more convenient than any town or city would have been for the place of meeting, on account of all the great troops of horses and the herds of animals by which the Khans were always accompanied in all their expeditions, and which made it necessary that, whenever any considerable number of them were to be convened, the place chosen should be suitable for a grand encampment, with extensive and fertile pasture grounds extending all around. As the several Khans came in, each at the head of his own troop of retainers and followers, they severally chose their ground, pitched their tents, and turned their herds of horses, sheep, and oxen out to pasture on the plains. Thus, in the course of a few days, the whole country in every direction became dotted with villages of tents, among which groups of horsemen were now and then to be seen galloping to and fro, and small herds of cattle, each under the care of herdsmen and slaves, moved slowly, cropping the grass as they advanced along the hillsides and through the valleys. At length, when all had assembled, a spot was selected in the center of the encampment for the performance of the ceremonies. A raised seat was prepared for Temujin in a situation suitable to enable him to address the assembly from it. Before and around this, the various khans and their attendants and followers gathered, and Temujin made them an oration, in which he explained the circumstances under which they had come together, and announced to them his plans and intentions in respect to the future. He stated to them that, in consequence of the victories which he had gained through their cooperation and assistance, the foundation of a great empire had been laid and that he had now called them together in order that they might join with him in organizing the requisite government for such a dominion, and in electing a prince or sovereign to rule over it. He called upon them first to proceed to the election of this ruler. The Khans accordingly proceeded to the election. This was, in fact, only a form, for Temujin himself was, of course, to be chosen.' 
The election was, however, made, and one of the oldest and most venerable of the khans was commissioned to announce the result. He came forward with great solemnity, and in the presence of the whole assembly, declared that the choice had fallen upon Temujin. He then made an address to Temujin himself, who was seated during this part of the ceremony upon a carpet of black felt spread upon the ground. In the address, the Khan reminded Temujin that the exalted authority with which he was now invested came from God, and that to God he was responsible for the right exercise of his power. If he governed his subjects well, God, he said, would render his reign prosperous and happy. But if, on the other hand, he abused his power, he would come to a miserable end. After the conclusion of the address, seven of the Khans, who had been designated for this purpose, came and lifted Temujin up and bore him away to a throne which had been set up for him in the midst of the assembly, where all the Khans and their various bodies of attendants came and offered him their homage. Among others there came a certain old prophet named Koxa, who was held in great veneration by all the people on account of his supposed inspiration and the austere life which he led. He used to go very thinly clad and with his feet bare summer and winter, and it was supposed that his power of enduring the exposures to which he was thus subject was something miraculous and divine. He had received accordingly from the people a name which signified the image of God, and he was everywhere looked upon as inspired. He said, moreover, that a white horse came to him from time to time and carried him up to heaven, where he conversed face to face with God, and received the revelations which he was commissioned to make to men. All this the people fully believed. The man may have been an impostor, or he may have been insane. Oftentimes, in such cases, the inspiration which the person supposes he is the subject of arises from a certain spiritual exaltation, which, though it does not wholly unfit him for the ordinary avocations and duties of life, still verges upon insanity, and often finally lapses into it entirely. This old prophet advanced toward Temujin while he was seated on his carpet of felt, and made a solemn address to him in the hearing of the assembled khans. He was charged, he said, with a message from heaven, in respect to the kingdom and dominion of Temujin, which had been, he declared, ordained of God, and had now been established in fulfillment of the divine will. He was commissioned, moreover, he said, to give to Temujin the style and title of Genghis Khan, and to declare that his kingdom should not only endure while he lived, but should descend to his posterity, from generation to generation, to the remotest times. The people, on hearing this address, at once adopted the name which the prophet had given to their new ruler, and saluted Temujin with it in long and loud acclamations. It was thus that our hero received the name of Genghis Khan, and soon extended its fame through every part of Asia, and has since become so greatly renowned through all the world. Temujin, or Genghis Khan, as we must now henceforth call him, having thus been proclaimed by the acclamations of the people under the new title with which the old prophet had invested him, sat upon his throne while his subjects came to render him their homage. First the Khans themselves came up, and kneeled nine times before him, in token of their absolute and complete submission to his authority. After they had retired, the people themselves came, and made their obeisance in the same manner. As they rose from their knees after the last prostration, they made the air resound once more with their shouts, crying, Long live great Genghis Khan, in repeated and prolonged acclamations. After this, the new emperor made what might be called his inaugural address. The Khans and their followers gathered once more before his throne, while he delivered an oration to them, in which he thanked them for the honor which they had done him in raising him to the supreme power, and announced to them the principles by which he should be guided in the government of his empire. 
He promised to be just in his dealings with his subjects, and also to be merciful. He would defend them, he said, against all their enemies. He would do everything in his power to promote their comfort and happiness. He would lead them to honor and glory, and would make their names known throughout the earth. He would deal, impartially too, with all the different tribes and hordes, and would treat the Mongols and the Tartars, the two great classes of his subjects, with equal favor. When the speech was concluded, Genghis Khan distributed presents to all the subordinate Khans, both great and small. He also made magnificent entertainments, which were continued for several days. After thus spending some time in feasting and rejoicings, the Khans, one after another, took their leave of the emperor. The great encampment was broken up, and the different tribes set out on their return to their several homes. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Dominions of Genghis Khan, 1203. After the ceremonies of the inauguration were concluded, Genghis Khan returned with the officers of his court and his immediate followers to Karakoram. This town, though nominally the capital of the empire, was, after all, quite an insignificant place. Indeed, but little importance was attached to any villages or towns in those days, and there were very few fixed places of residence that were of any considerable account. The reason is that towns are the seats of commerce and manufactures, and they derive their chief importance from those pursuits, whereas the Mongols and Tartars led almost exclusively a wandering and pastoral life and all their ideas of wealth and grandeur were associated with great flocks and herds of cattle, and handsome tents, and long trains of wagons loaded with stores of clothing, arms, and other movables, and vast encampments in the neighborhood of rich and extended pasture grounds. Those who lived permanently in fixed houses they looked down upon as an inferior class, confined to one spot by their poverty or their toil while they themselves could roam at liberty with their flocks and herds over the plains, riding fleet horses or dromedaries, and encamping where they pleased in the green valleys or on the banks of the meandering streams. Karakoram was accordingly by no means a great and splendid city. It was surrounded by what was called a mud wall, that is, a wall made of blocks of clay dried in the sun. The houses of the inhabitants were mere hovels, and even the palace of the king and all of the other public buildings were of very frail construction, for all the architecture of the Mongols in those days took its character from the tent, which was the type and model, so to speak, of all other buildings. The new emperor, however, did not spend a great deal of his time at Karakoram. He was occupied for some years in making excursions at the head of his troops to various parts of his dominions for the purpose of putting down insurrections, overawing discontented and insubordinate khans, and settling disputes of various kinds arising between the different hordes. In these expeditions he was accustomed to move by easy marches across the plains at the head of his army, and sometimes would establish himself in a sort of permanent camp, where he would remain, perhaps, as in a fixed residence, for weeks or months at a time. Not only Genghis Khan himself, but many of the other great chieftains were accustomed to live in this manner, and one of their encampments, if we could have seen it, would have been regarded by us as a great curiosity. The ground was regularly laid out, like a town, into quarters, squares, and streets, and the space which it covered was sometimes so large as to extend nearly a mile in each direction. The tent of the Khan himself was in the center. A space was reserved for it there large enough not only for the grand tent itself, but also for the rows of smaller tents near, for the wives and for other women belonging to the Khan's family, and also for the rows of carts or wagons containing the stores of provisions, the supplies of clothing and arms, and the other valuables which these wandering chieftains always took with them in all their peregrinations. The tent of the Khan in summer was made of a sort of calico, 
and in winter of felt, which was much warmer. It was raised very high, so as to be seen above all the rest of the encampment, and it was painted in gay colors and adorned with other barbaric decorations. The dwellings in which the women were lodged, which were around or near the great tent, were sometimes tents and sometimes little huts made of wood. When they were of wood, they were made very light and were constructed in such a manner that they could be taken to pieces at the shortest notice and packed on carts or wagons in order to be transported to the next place of encampment whenever, for any reason, it became necessary for their lord and master to remove his domicile to a different ground. A large portion of the country which was included within the limits of Genghis Khan's dominions was fertile ground, which produced abundance of grass for the pasturage of the flocks and herds, and many springs and streams of water. There were, however, several districts of mountainous country which were the refuge of tigers, leopards, wolves, and other ferocious beasts of prey. It was among these mountains that the great hunting parties, which Genghis Khan organized from time to time, went in search of their game. There was a great officer of the kingdom, called the Grand Huntsman, who had the superintendence and charge of everything related to hunting and to game throughout the empire. The Grand Huntsman was an officer of the very highest rank. He even took precedence of the first ministers of state. Genghis Khan appointed his son, Juki, who has already been mentioned in connection with the great council of war called by his father, and with the battle which was subsequently fought, and in which he gained great renown, to the office of Grand Huntsman, and at the same time made two of the older and more experienced Khans his ministers of state. The hunting of wild beasts as ferocious as those that infested the mountains of Asia is a very dangerous amusement even at the present day, notwithstanding the advantage which the huntsman derives from the use of gunpowder and rifled barrels and fulminating bullets. But in those days, when the huntsman had no better weapons than bows and arrows, javelins and spears, the undertaking was dangerous in the extreme. An African lion of full size used to be considered as a match for forty men in the days when only ordinary weapons were used against him, and it was considered almost hopeless to attack him with less than that number. And even with that number to waylay and assail him, he was not usually conquered until he had killed or disabled two or three of his foes. Now, however, with the terrible artillery invented in modern times, a single man, if he has the requisite courage, coolness, and steadiness of nerve, is a match for such a lion. The weapon used is a double-barreled carabine, both barrels being rifled, that is, provided with spiral grooves within that operate to give the bullets a rotary motion as they issue from the muzzle, by which they bore their way through the air, as it were, to their destination, with a surprising directness and precision. The bullets discharged by these carabines are not balls, but cylinders, pointed with a cone at the forward end. They are hollow and are filled with a fulminating composition, which is capable of exploding with a force vastly greater than that of gunpowder. The conical point at the end is made separate from the body of the cylinder and slides into it by a sort of shank, which, when the bullet strikes the body of the lion or other wild beast, acts like a sort of percussion cap to explode the fulminating powder, and thus the instant that the missile enters the animal's body, it bursts with a terrible explosion and scatters the iron fragments of the cylinder among his vitals. Thus, while an ordinary musket ball might lodge in his flesh, or even pass entirely through some parts of his body without producing any other effect than to arouse him to a frenzy and redouble the force with which he would spring upon his foe, the bursting of one of these fulminating bullets almost anywhere within his body brings him down in an instant and leaves him writhing and rolling upon the ground in the agonies of death. On the Boulevard des Italiens in Paris is the manufactory of the Visma, 
who makes these carabines for the lion hunters of Algiers. Promenaders, in passing by his windows, stop to look at specimens of these bullets exhibited there. They are of various sizes, adapted to barrels of different bores. Some are entire, others are rent and torn in pieces, having been fired into a bank of earth, that they might burst there as they would do in the body of a wild beast, and then be recovered and preserved to show the effect of the explosion. Even with such terrible weapons as these, it requires at the present day great courage, great coolness, and very extraordinary steadiness of nerve to face a lion or a tiger in his mountain fastness with any hope of coming off victorious in the contest. But the danger was, of course, infinitely greater in the days of Genghis Khan, when pikes and spears and bows and arrows were the only weapons with which the body of huntsmen could arm themselves for the combat. Indeed, in those days, wild beasts were even in some respects more formidable enemies than men. For men, however excited by angry passions, are in some degree under the influence of fear. They will not rush headlong upon absolute and certain destruction, but may be driven back by a mere display of force, if it is obvious that it is a force which they are wholly incapable of resisting. Thus a party of men, however desperate, may be attacked without much danger to the assailants, provided that the force which the assailants bring against them is overwhelming. But it is not so with wild beasts. A lion, a tiger, or a panther, once aroused, is wholly insensible to fear. He will rush headlong upon his foes, however numerous they may be, and however formidably armed. He makes his own destruction sure, it is true, but at the same time he renders almost inevitable the destruction of someone or more of his enemies, and in going out to attack him no one can be sure of not becoming himself one of the victims of his fury. Thus the hunting of wild beasts in the mountains was very dangerous work, and it is not surprising that the office of Grand Huntsman was one of great consideration and honor. The hunting was, however, not all of the dangerous character above described. Some animals are timid and inoffensive by nature, and attempt to save themselves only by flight. Such animals as these were to be pursued and overtaken by the superior speed of horses and dogs, or to be circumvented by stratagem. There was a species of deer in certain parts of the Mongol country that the huntsmen were accustomed to take in this way, namely, the huntsmen, when they began to draw near to a place where a herd of deer were feeding, would divide themselves into two parties. One party would provide themselves with the antlers of stags, which they arranged in such a manner that they could hold them up over their heads in the thickets, as if real stags were there. The others, armed with bows and arrows, javelins, spears, and other such weapons, would place themselves in ambush nearby. Those who had the antlers would then make a sort of cry, imitating that uttered by the hinds. The stags of the herd, hearing the cry, would immediately come toward the spot. The men in the thicket then would raise the antlers and move them about, so as to deceive the stags and excite their feelings of rivalry and ire while those who were appointed to that office continued to counterfeit the cry of the hind. The stags immediately would begin to paw the ground and to prepare for a conflict, and then, while their attention was thus wholly taken up by the tossing of the false antlers in the thicket, the men in ambush would creep up as near as they could, take good aim, and shoot their poor deluded victims through the heart. Of course, it required a great deal of practice and much skill to perform successfully such feats as these, and there were many other branches of the huntsman's art, as practiced in those days, which could only be acquired by a systematic and special course of training. One of the most difficult things was to train the horses so that they would advance to meet tigers and other wild beasts without fear. Horses have naturally a strong and instinctive terror for such beasts, and this terror it was very difficult to overcome. The Mongol huntsmen, however, 
contrived means to inspire the horses with so much courage in this respect that they would advance to the encounter of these terrible foes with as much ardor as a trained charger shows in advancing to meet other horses and horsemen on the field of battle. Besides the mountainous regions above described, there were several deserts in the country of the Mongols. The greatest of these deserts extends through the very heart of Asia and is one of the most extensive districts of barren land in the world. Unlike most other deserts, however, the land is very elevated, and it is to this elevation that its barrenness is, in a great measure, due. A large part of this desert consists of rocks and barren sands, and in the time of which we are writing was totally uninhabitable. It was so cold, too, on account of the great elevation of the land, that it was almost impossible to traverse it except in the warmest season of the year. Other parts of this district, which were not so elevated, and where the land was not quite so barren, produced grass and herbage on which the flocks and herds could feed, and thus, in certain seasons of the year, people resorted to them for pasturage. Throughout the whole country there were no extensive forests. There were a few tangled thickets among the mountains, where the wild beasts concealed themselves and made their lairs, but this was all. One reason why forests did not spring up was, as is supposed, the custom of the people to burn over the plains every spring, as the Indians were accustomed to do on the American prairies. In the spring, the dead grass of the preceding year lay dry and withered, and sometimes closely matted together on the ground, thus hindering, as the people thought, the fresh grass from growing up. So the people were accustomed on some spring morning when there was a good breeze blowing, to set it on fire. The fire would run rapidly over the plains, burning up everything in its way that was above the ground. But the roots of the grass, being below, were safe from it. Very soon afterward, the new grass would spring up with great luxuriance. The people thought that the rich verdure which the new grass displayed and its subsequent rapid growth were owing simply to the fact that the old dead grass was out of the way. It is now known, however, that the burning of the old grass leaves an ash upon the ground which acts powerfully as a fertilizer, and that the richness of the fresh vegetation is due, in a great measure, to this cause. Such was the country which was inhabited by the wandering pastoral tribes that were now under the sway of Genghis Khan. His dominion had no settled boundaries, for it was a dominion over certain tribes rather than over a certain district of country. Nearly all the tribes composing both the Mongol and the Tartar nations had now submitted to him, though he still had some small wars to wage from time to time with some of the more distant tribes before his authority was fully and finally acknowledged. The history of some of these conflicts will be narrated in the next chapter. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 – Adventures of Prince Kushluk, 1203-1208 Prince Kushluk, as the reader will perhaps recollect, was the son of Tayan, the Khan of the Naimans, who organized the Grand League of Khans against Temujin at the instigation of Yamuka, as related in a preceding chapter. He was the young prince who was opposed to Jughi, the son of Temujin, in the great final battle. The reader will recollect that in that battle, Tayin himself was slain, as was also Yamaka, but the young prince succeeded in making his escape. He was accompanied in his flight by a certain general or chieftain named Tukta Bey. This Tukta Bey was the Khan of a powerful tribe. The name of the town or village which he considered his capital was Kashin. It was situated towards the southwest not far from the borders of China. Takta Bey, taking Kushluk with him, retreated to this place and there began to make preparations to collect a new army to act against Temujin. I say Temujin, for these circumstances took place immediately after the battle and before Temujin had received his new title of Genghis Khan. Temujin, having learned that Tukta Bey and the young prince had gone to Kashin, 
determined at once to follow them there. As soon as Tukta Bey heard that he was coming, he began to strengthen the fortifications of his town and to increase the garrison. He also laid in supplies of food and military stores of all kinds. While he was making these preparations, he received the news that Temujin was advancing into his country at the head of an immense force. The force was so large that he was convinced that his town could not long stand out against it. He was greatly perplexed to know what to do. Now it happened that there was a brother of Tayyan Khan's named Boyrak, the chief of a powerful horde that occupied a district of country not very far distant from Tukta Bey's dominions. Tukta Bey thought that this Boyrak would be easily induced to aid him in the war as it was a war waged against the mortal enemy of his brother. He determined to leave his capital to be defended by the garrison which he had placed in it and to proceed himself to Boyrak's country to obtain reinforcements. He first sent off the prince Kushluk so that he might be as soon as possible in a place of safety. Then, after completing the necessary arrangements and dispositions for the defense of his town, in case it should be attacked during his absence, he took his oldest son, for whose safety he was also greatly concerned, and set out at the head of a small troop of horsemen to go to Boyrak. Accordingly, when Temujin, at the head of his forces, arrived at the town of Kashin, he found that the fugitives whom he was pursuing were no longer there. However, he determined to take the town. He accordingly at once invested it and commenced the siege. The garrison made a very determined resistance, but the forces under Temujin's command were too strong for them. The town was soon taken. Temujin ordered his soldiers to slay without mercy all who were found in arms against him within the walls, and the walls themselves, and all other defenses of the place, he caused to be leveled with the ground. He then issued his proclamation, offering peace and pardon to all the rest of the tribe, on condition that they would take the oath of allegiance to him. This they readily agreed to do. There were a great many subordinate khans, both of this tribe and of some others that were near, who thus yielded to Temujin and promised to obey him. All this took place, as has already been said, immediately after the great battle with Tayyan, and before Temujin had been enthroned as emperor, or had received his new title of Genghis Khan. Indeed, Temujin, while making this expedition to Kashin, in pursuit of Kushluk and Takta Bey, had been somewhat uneasy at the loss of time which the campaign occasioned him, as he was anxious to go as soon as possible to Karakoram, in order to take the necessary measures there for arranging and consolidating his government. He accordingly now determined not to pursue the fugitives any farther, but to proceed at once to Karakoram and postpone all farther operations against Kushluk and Tukta until the next season. So he went to Karakoram and there, during the course of the winter, formed the constitution of his new empire and made arrangements for convening a grand assembly of the Khans the next spring, as related in the last chapter. In the meantime, Tukta Bey and the Prince Kushluk were very kindly received by Boyrak, Tayyan's brother. For a time, they all had reason to expect that Temujin, after having taken and destroyed Kashin, would continue his pursuit of the prince, and Boyrak began accordingly to make preparations for defense. But when, at length, they learned that Temujin had given up the pursuit and had returned to Karakoram, their apprehensions were, for the moment, relieved. They were, however, well aware that the danger was only postponed, and Boyrak, being determined to defend the cause of his nephew and to avenge, if possible, his brother's death, occupied himself diligently with increasing his army, strengthening his fortifications, and providing himself with all possible means of defense against the attack which he expected would be made upon him in the coming season. Boyrak's expectations of an attack were fully realized. Temujin, after having settled the affairs of his government, 
and having now become Genghis Khan, took the first opportunity in the following season to fit out an expedition against Tukta Bay and Boyrak. He marched into Boyrak's dominions at the head of a strong force. Boyrak came forth to meet him. A great battle was fought. Boyrak was entirely defeated. When he found that the battle was lost, he attempted to fly. He was, however, pursued and taken, and was then brought back to the camp of Genghis Khan, where he was put to death. The conqueror undoubtedly justified this act of cruelty toward his helpless prisoner on the plea that, like Yamaka, he was not an open and honorable foe, but a rebel and traitor, and consequently that the act of putting him to death was the execution of a criminal and not the murder of a prisoner. But although Boyrak himself was thus taken and slain, Kushluk and Tukta Bey succeeded in making their escape. They fled to the northward and westward, scarcely knowing, it would seem, where they were to go. They at last found a place of refuge on the banks of the river Urdish. This river rises not far from the center of the Asiatic continent and flows northward into the northern ocean. The country through which it flows lay to the northwestward of Genghis Khan's dominions and beyond the confines of it. Through this country, Prince Kushluk and Tukta Bey wandered on, accompanied by the small troop of followers that still adhered to them, until they reached a certain fortress called Ardish, where they determined to make a stand. They were among friends here, for Ardish, it seems, was on the confines of territory that belonged to Tukta Bey. The people of the neighborhood immediately flocked to Tukta's standard, and thus the fugitive Khan soon found himself at the head of a considerable force. This force was farther increased by the coming in of broken bands that had made their escape from the battle at which Boyrak had been slain at the same time with Tukta Bey, but had become separated from him in their flight. It would seem that, at first, Genghis Khan did not know what was become of the fugitives. At any rate, it was not until the next year that he attempted to pursue them. Then, hearing where they were and what they were doing, he prepared an expedition to penetrate into the country of the Urtish and attack them. It was in the dead of winter when he arrived in the country. He had hurried on at that season of the year in order to prevent Tukta Bey from having time to finish his fortifications. Tukta Bey and those who were with him were amazed when they heard that their enemy was coming at that season of the year. The defenses which they were preparing for their fortress were not fully completed, but they were at once convinced that they could not hold their ground against the body of troops that Genghis Khan was bringing against them in the open field, and so they all took shelter in and near the fortress and awaited their enemy there. The winters in that latitude are very cold, and the country through which Genghis Khan had to march was full of difficulty. The branches of the river which he had to cross were obstructed with ice, and the roads were in many places rendered almost impassable by snow. The emperor did not even know the way to the fortress where Tukta Bey and his followers were concealed, and it would have been almost impossible for him to find it had it not been for certain tribes, through whose territories he passed on the way, who furnished him with guides. These tribes, perceiving how overwhelming was the force which Genghis Khan commanded, knew that it would be useless for them to resist him. So they yielded submission to him at once, and detached parties of horsemen to go with him down the river to show him the way. Under the conduct of these guides, Genghis Khan passed on. In due time he arrived at the fortress of Ardish, and immediately forced Tukta Bey and his allies to come to an engagement. Tukta's army was very soon defeated and put to flight. Tukta himself and many other Khans and chieftains who had joined him were killed. But the prince Kushluk was once more fortunate enough to make his escape. He fled with a small troop of followers, all mounted on fleet horses, and after various wanderings, in the course of which he and those who were with him endured a great deal of privation and suffering, 
the unhappy fugitive at last reached the dominions of a powerful prince named Gurkhan, who reigned over a country which is situated in the western part of Asia, toward the Caspian Sea, and is named Turkestan. This is the country from which the people called the Turks, who afterwards spread themselves so widely over the western part of Asia and the eastern part of Europe, originally sprung. Gurkhan received Kushluk and his party in a very friendly manner, and Genghis Khan did not follow them. Whether he thought that the distance was too great, or that the power of Gurkhan was too formidable to make it prudent for him to advance into his dominions without a stronger force, does not appear. At any rate, for the time being, he gave up the pursuit, and after fully securing the fruits of the victory which he had gained at Ardish, and receiving the submission of all the tribes and khans that inhabited that region of country, he set out on his return home. It is related that one of the khans who gave in his submission to Genghis Khan at this time made him a present of a certain bird called a shangar, according to a custom often observed among the people of that region. The shangar was a very large and fierce bird of prey, which, however, could be trained like the falcons which were so much prized in the Middle Ages by the princes and nobles of Europe. It seems it was customary for an inferior khan to present one of these birds to his superior on great occasions as an emblem and token of his submission to his superior's authority. The bird in such a case was very richly decorated with gold and precious stones, so that the present was sometimes of a very costly and magnificent character. Genghis Khan received such a present as this from a chieftain named Ursus Inal, who was among those that yielded to his sway in the country of the Urtish after the battle at which Tukta Bey was defeated and killed. The bird was presented to Genghis Khan by Urus with great ceremony as an act of submission and homage. What in the end was the fate of Prince Kushluk will appear in the next chapter. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of the History of Genghis Khan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 14, Itacut, 1208. Itacut, the old system of farming revenues evils of farming the revenue. There was another great and powerful khan named Itacut, whose tribe had hitherto been under the dominion of Gurkhan, the prince of Turkestan, where Kushluk had sought refuge, but who about this time revolted from Gurkhan and went over to Genghis Khan, under circumstances which illustrate in some degree the peculiar nature of the political ties by which these different tribes and nations were bound to each other. It seems that the tribe over which Etiquette ruled was tributary to Turkestan, and that Gurkhan had an officer stationed in Etiquette's country whose business it was to collect and remit the tribute. The name of this collector was Shuwakim. He was accustomed, it seems, like almost all tax gatherers in those days, to exact more than was his due. The system generally adopted by governments in that age of the world for collecting their revenues from tributary or conquered provinces was to farm them, as the phrase was. That is, they sold the whole revenue of a particular district in the gross to some rich man who paid for it a specific sum considerably less, of course, than the tax itself would really yield, and then he reimbursed himself for his outlay and for his trouble by collecting the tax in detail from the people. Of course, it was for the interest of the tax gatherer in such a case, after having paid the round sum to the government, to extort as much as possible from the people, since all that he obtained over and above the sum that he had paid 
was his profit on the transaction. Then, if the people complained to the government of his exactions, they could seldom obtain any redress, for the government knew that if they rebuked or punished the farmer of the revenue or interfered with him in any way, they would not be able to make so favorable terms with him for the next year. Modern System Disinterested Collectors Independent and Impartial Courts Waste of the Public Money The plan of farming the revenues thus led to a great deal of extortion and oppression, which the people were compelled patiently to endure, as there was generally no remedy. In modern times and among civilized nations, this system has been almost universally abandoned. The taxes are now always collected for the government directly by officers who have to pay over not a fixed sum, but simply what they collect. Thus, the tax gatherers are, in some sense, impartial, since if they collect more than the law entitles them to demand, the benefit inures almost wholly to the government, they themselves gaining little or no advantage by their extortion. Besides this, there are courts established which are, in a great measure, independent of the government, to which the taxpayer can appeal at once in a case where he thinks he is aggrieved. This, it is true, often puts him to a great deal of trouble and expense, but in the end he is pretty sure to have justice done him, while under the old system there was ordinarily no remedy at all. There was nothing to be done but to appeal to the king or chieftain himself, and these complaints seldom received any attention, for besides the natural unwillingness of the sovereign to trouble himself about such disputes, he had a direct interest in not requiring the extorted money to be paid back, or rather in not having it proved that it was extorted. Thus the poor taxpayer found that the officer who collected the money and the umpire who was to decide in case of disputes were both directly interested against him, and he was continually wronged. Whereas at the present day, by means of a system which provides disinterested officers to determine and collect the tax, and independent judges to decide all cases of dispute, the evils are almost wholly avoided. The only difficulty now is the extravagance and waste with which the public money is expended, making it necessary to collect a much larger amount than would otherwise be required. Perhaps some future generation will discover some plain and simple remedy for this evil, too. Shuwakam. The name of the officer who had the general charge of the collection of the taxes in Idikut's territory for Gurkhan, king of Turkestan, was, as has already been said, Shuwakam. He oppressed the people, exacting more from them than was really due, whether he had farmed the revenue and was thus enriching himself by his extortions, or whether he was acting directly in Gurkhan's name and made the people pay more than he ought from zeal in his master's service and a desire to recommend himself to favor by sending home to Turkestan as large a revenue from the provinces as possible, does not appear. At all events, the people complained bitterly. They had, however, no access to Gurkhan, Shuwakam's master, and so they carried their complaints to Idikut, their own khan. Idikut's quarrel with Gurkhan's tax gatherers. Idikut remonstrated with Shuwakam, but he, instead of taking the remonstrance in good part and relaxing the severity of his proceedings, resented the interference of Idikut and answered him in a haughty and threatening manner. This made Idikut very angry. Indeed, he was angry before, as it might naturally be supposed that he would have been, at having a person owing allegiance to a foreign prince exercising authority in a proud and domineering manner within his dominions, and the reply which Shuwakam made when he remonstrated with him on account of his extortions exasperated him beyond all bounds. He immediately caused Shuwakam to be assassinated. He also slew 
all the other officers of Gurkhan within his country, those probably who were employed to assist Shuwakam in collecting the taxes. Rebellion. He sends to Genghis Khan. The murder of these officers was, of course, an act of open rebellion against Gurkhan, and Itikut, in order to shield himself from the consequences of it, determined to join himself and his tribe at once to the empire of Genghis Khan. So he immediately dispatched two ambassadors to the Mongol emperor with his proposals. The envoys, accompanied by a suitable troop of guards and attendants, went into the Mongol country and presently came up with Genghis Khan, while he was on a march toward the country of some tribe or horde that had revolted from him. They were very kindly received, for although Genghis Khan was not prepared at present to make open war upon Gurkhan or to invade his dominions in pursuit of Prince Kushluk, he was intending to do this at some future day, and in the meantime, he was very glad to weaken his enemy by drawing off from his empire any tributary tribes that were at all disposed to revolt from him. His Reception of the Embassy he accordingly received the ambassadors of Itikut in a very cordial and friendly manner. He readily acceded to the proposals which Itikut made through them, and in order to give full proof to Itikut of the readiness and sincerity with which he accepted his proposals, he sent back two ambassadors of his own to accompany Itikut's ambassadors on their return and to join them in assuring that prince of the cordiality with which Genghis Khan accepted his offers of friendship and to promise his protection. Itikut's Visit to Genghis Khan Itikut was very much pleased when his messengers returned to learn that his mission had been so successful. He immediately determined to go himself and visit Genghis Khan in his camp in order to confirm the new alliance by making a personal tender to the emperor of his homage and his services. He accordingly prepared some splendid presents, and placing himself at the head of his troop of guards, he proceeded to the camp of Genghis Khan. The emperor received him in a very kind and friendly manner. He accepted his presence, and in the end was so much pleased with Itikut himself that he gave him one of his daughters in marriage. Gurkhan in a rage. As for Gurkhan, when he first heard of the murder of Shuwakam and the other officers, he was in a terrible rage. He declared that he would revenge his servant by laying waste Itikut's territories with fire and sword. But when he heard that Itikut had placed himself under the protection of Genghis Khan, and especially when he learned that he had married the emperor's daughter, he thought it more prudent to postpone his vengeance not being quite willing to draw upon himself the hostility of so great a power. Subsequent History of Kushluk Jena Prince Kushluk remained for many years in Turkestan and in the countries adjoining it. He married a daughter of Gurkhan, his protector. Partly in consequence of this connection and of the high rank which he had held in his own native land, and partly, perhaps, in consequence of his personal courage and other military qualities, he rapidly acquired great influence among the Khans of Western Asia, and at last he organized a sort of rebellion against Gurkhan, made war against him, and deprived him of more than half his dominions. He then collected a large army and prepared to make war upon Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan sent one of his best generals at the head of a small but very compact and well-disciplined force against him. The name of this general was Jenna. Kushluk was not at all intimidated by the danger which now threatened him. His own army was much larger than that of Jenna, and he accordingly advanced to meet his enemy without fear. He was, however, beaten in the battle, and when he saw that the day was lost, he fled, followed by a small party of horsemen who succeeded in saving themselves with him. Kushluk's final defeat and flight, hotly pursued by Jenna. Jenna set out immediately in pursuit of the fugitive, accompanied by a small body of men mounted on the fleetest horses. The party who were with Kushluk 
being exhausted by the fatigue of the battle and bewildered by the excitement and terror of their flight, could not keep together, but were overtaken one by one and slain by their pursuers until only three were left. These three kept close to Kushluk and with him went on until Jenna's party lost the track of them. At length, coming to a place where two roads met, Jenna asked a peasant if he had seen any strange horsemen pass that way. The peasant said that four horsemen had passed a short time before, and he told Jenna which road they had taken. Kushluk's death. Jenna and his party rode on in that direction which the peasant had indicated, and pushing forward with redoubled speed, they soon overtook the unhappy fugitives. They fell upon Kushluk without mercy and killed him on the spot. They then cut off his head and turned back to carry it to Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan's Triumph Genghis Khan rewarded Jenna in the most magnificent manner for his successful performance of this exploit, and then, putting Kushluk's head upon a pole, he displayed it in all the camps and villages through which he passed, where it served at once as a token and a trophy of his victory against an enemy, and at the same time as a warning to all other persons of the terrible danger which they would incur in attempting to resist his power. End of chapter 14